Let's begin the next section and discuss the role of constraints. Carl Newell proposed a model of factors or constraints that dynamically interact and result in particular motor behaviors at different times in an individual's life. There are three categories of constraints. Organism or individual constraints, environmental constraints, and task constraints. To understand why a particular movement is exhibited, we need to consider the characteristics of the individual moving, his or her surroundings or environment, and the purpose or goal of the movement tasks. Consider the following example. A baby taking his or her first steps, a child walking on sand, and an older adult walking on an icy sidewalk. In this example, the goal or task constraint is always the same, to walk from one place to another. But the individual and environmental constraints vary and result in very different walking patterns. Let's define exactly what is meant by the term constraint. A constraint may limit or discourage certain types of movements. A constraint may also permit or encourage certain types of movements. So you cannot always think of constraints as a negative. They are simply factors that may act to channel behavior to look a particular way. One way to think about this is to use the metaphor of a riverbed. A riverbed allows a river to move in different ways. It channels the direction, location, and speed of the river's movement. Now let's talk about each type of constraint. First, individual constraints are a person's unique physical and mental characteristics. There are two types of individual constraints. Structural constraints include factors such as height, weight, muscle mass, leg strength, and brain growth. We can think of these as an individual's physical characteristics. In this picture, there are many obvious differences in the structural constraints between these two basketball players. Functional constraints, on the other hand, include factors such as motivation, anxiety, experience, attentional focus, or cognitive capacity. Environmental constraints are the characteristics of the world around us. There are two types of environmental constraints. Physical environmental constraints include factors such as temperature, humidity, gravity, types of surfaces, availability of equipment, or resources, including the built environment. For example, during the summer in Auburn, the physical environment makes it difficult to walk on campus. It's hot, humid, and often the sidewalks end without any reason. Sociocultural environmental constraints include factors such as social appropriateness and access to opportunities. For example, this picture is part of an article that talks about a nonprofit organization that created indoor skate parks for girls in Afghanistan. In order for these girls to learn how to skateboard, changes in both the sociocultural environment, particularly social acceptance of girls playing sports, as well as a physical built environment needed to change. Task constraints are the characteristics, purpose, or goals of the movement activity, including factors such as the rules of the activity, the equipment, and the setting. For example, a practice or a game. Here is an example of a change in the task characteristics. When the hoop is low, the child can dunk the ball. But when the hoop is raised, the child must shoot the ball. So by changing the task constraints, namely the height of the basketball hoop, the movements that are possible or required have correspondingly changed. Much of motor developmental research in the first half of the 20th century was dedicated to creating developmental profiles of motor milestones. In other words, we were really concerned with motor development on average. To do this research, we had to study many children to determine the similarities and typical patterns of motor development. This figure shows the average age at which an infant learns to crawl. The typical age range is quite large and spans from 5 months of age to 11 months of age. However, many constraints influence an individual's development and the achievement of typical patterns of motor behavior. For example, a child may be considered advanced or precocious 
if they learn to crawl at five months of age. A child may be considered delayed if they learn to crawl at 16 months of age. Interestingly, a child may show a completely different pattern. For example, instead of crawling on his or her knees, this child crawls on his hands or feet. She still acquires a skill within the typical age range for crawling, but the pattern is completely different. When we consider atypical patterns of behavior, again, there are many factors or constraints that may underlie these movement differences. For example, a child with Down syndrome may be delayed in learning to walk because his or her cognitive abilities are also developmentally delayed. A different example is an adult with a knee replacement. He or she may walk with an altered gait until he or she recovers from the surgery. If you were to work with these individuals as a parent or a therapist, you might modify the task constraints like the walking surface or the distance needed to walk in order to accommodate the differences in individual constraints. Before we move on to the next section, I just want to recap. In order to understand why a particular person is exhibiting a particular movement at a particular time, we must consider the interaction amongst the individual, environmental, and task constraints. By modifying any one of these different constraints, a different movement pattern may emerge. As teachers, therapists, parents, and researchers, we can take advantage of this information so that we can try to promote particular behaviors from our students, patients, children, or research participants.